The portion of God's word on which we'll focus our hearts this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you walk downtown in most big cities, if you kind of walk around the stadium at a professional sporting event, you'll probably come across one at some point. That is a a person standing up on a stool, shouting at the passers-by through a bullhorn, and often carrying a sign on which is hastily scrawled in Sharpie, the end is near. Now, when you see a street corner preacher like that, what do you think their intention is in proclaiming that message to all passers-by, the end is near? Really, those, those doomsday proclaimers have, have one purpose, one intention in mind. They want you to picture flames, destruction, and chaos. They want to rouse people out of spiritual apathy, out of sin and unbelief, with the terrifying truth that God is going to come back again someday as a a vengeful, wrathful judge. They want people to hear the phrase, the end is near, and have their hearts filled with fear. And sometimes that's needed, isn't it? A couple Sundays ago, we heard from Jesus the warning that we need to be properly prepared for when Jesus comes back again, otherwise we're going to get locked out of the eternal wedding banquet. Sometimes we need the fear of God's law to wake us up from our spiritual slumber and our misprioritized living. Sometimes we need the end is near to give us a sense of urgency about preparing our hearts for when Jesus comes again. But unlike the intention of the street corner preacher, the end is near for us as Christians doesn't have to fill our hearts with fear. Instead, the phrase, the end is near for us as Christians, can fill our hearts with hope. That was really the intention that the Apostle Paul had in writing his letter to the Thessalonian Christians in that Greek city of Thessalonica. They needed hope. Because shortly after Paul had begun doing gospel ministry, sharing the good news of Jesus with those people in that city, formulating kind of a small group of Christians there, Intense persecution from the Jews forced Paul to flee for his life. And so some problems came up. Because as Paul left, because of the persecution, the persecution didn't leave with him. And so these new, fledgling young Christians were facing constant persecution for their faith in Christ. And so Paul writes this letter to be a source of encouragement for these Christians to stand firm in the face of persecution, to cling to their faith, even in that difficulty. Because Paul spent such a a short amount of time there to train and teach them, there were also some misunderstandings among those Christians about some of the teachings of God's truth, specifically about Judgment Day. They lived under the false belief that, that all believers in Christ would live until the day when Jesus came again. And so they were fearful, they were concerned about their Christian loved ones who had already passed away by that point. Would they have to just sort of miss out on the glorious day when Jesus would come again? Would they ever get to see those loved ones anymore? And so Paul writes this letter to these Christians with a a heavy amount of eschatology, which is the teachings about the last days and about Judgment Day. He shows them at the end of each chapter in this letter that he writes, he makes some reference to when Jesus will come again. And he writes about the end, he explains to them about the end, he corrects their misconceptions about the end, not to fill their hearts with fear and terror, but to fill their hearts with hope, because the end is near. And there's still today a lot of confusion and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of misunderstandings about the last day and the last days in which we're living. And so God uses this letter that Paul wrote as well by God's inspiration to encourage and equip and explain to us so that we also can hear that the end is near and be filled with hope. You see, to truly understand and to have that that hope that Judgment Day gives to the Christian, we really have to understand what the Bible means when it talks about hope. 
You see, in English, we tend to equate hope as kind of a synonym of a, a wish or a desire. I hope I'll get that for Christmas. I hope my team wins that game. Wishes and desires, but not certainties. And if that's the definition of hope that we're using to talk about the last days, then we might look at Judgment Day with a lot more fear than hope. I hope Jesus comes back again. I hope he'll take me to heaven when he does, but we can't really be certain. But when the Bible uses the word hope, it's not talking about things that aren't certain. When the Bible uses the word hope, it's talking about an absolute certainty. Just an absolute certainty that hasn't yet been fully received. And so when we talk about the hope of the last day, we're saying we know with absolute certainty that Jesus will come back again. We know with absolute certainty that Jesus will glorify us and perfect us. We know that with absolute certainty because his own word tells us those truths. We know with absolute certainty, we just haven't received it in full yet. And that's why the end is near can give us hope. It's also why the end is near needs to give us hope. Because we live in this time in between, the time between Jesus' first coming and his coming again, because Jesus hasn't yet come back again to make all things new again, that means that you and I live in the time in between that's still broken and flawed by sin. Which means that in this time in between, you and I still have a sinful nature that we have to do battle with. A sinful nature that drives us to live for ourselves rather than living in service to God and so often is successful in its endeavor. It means that you and I still feel aches and pains and weakness and suffering and the deterioration of our physical bodies and minds. It means that we and the people that we love will someday die. It means that we still experience things like natural disasters and accidents and tragedies. It means we still have to be terrorized by things like war and violence and bloodshed and hostility and injustice. It means we still feel the weight and the guilt of our sin. See, we still live in this time in between in this world broken by sin. And so the pain and the loss and the struggles and the frustrations of living in this time in between, it causes us to groan. To groan under the weight. As Paul writes to the Romans, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. We groan as we live in this time in between. But as we groan, we also yearn. We yearn for the end. And we yearn for the end because in the end, there's hope. And that's what Paul is trying to bring across to these Thessalonian Christians that he writes to. He writes to them so he can pour out for them the reasons that they can have hope as they await for the day when Jesus would come again. First of all, he he eases their fears by correcting their misunderstandings about their deceased Christian loved ones. He writes to them, We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who, hear this, the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, we who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. See, unlike the rest of the world that views death as the ultimate unavoidable ending, this terrifying monstrosity that we need to avoid at all costs, We as Christians, we can grieve, and and we certainly do grieve over the ugliness of death. We grieve, but we grieve in a completely different way. Unlike those who have no hope, we as Christians grieve with hope. We grieve with hope because when Jesus comes again, he promises that he's going to raise back to life those who have died in the Lord. That we and all those he has raised back to life will be brought together and gathered together once again in the presence of our Savior for all eternity. 
And along with that hope for those Christians who have fallen asleep in death, Paul continues by showing us the hope that we have if, if we're still alive when Jesus comes again. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. When Jesus comes again, he's going to gather together all of us who are still alive on that day, gather us together with all those he's raised back to life again so that we again can be with the Lord eternally. Now to kind of summarize this, to understand this reading and the other two readings and a lot of the other things we hear about the last day in Scripture, we need to understand that all of this is taking place at the same time. This isn't over the course of many days. This isn't the course of thousands of years in between these events. This is all taking place on the last day. And so we're told that on that last day, Jesus will come again with a loud trumpet blast, with the angels, with the voice of the archangel crying out so that no one is going to miss it. And when Jesus comes again on that day, he's going to raise back to life the bodies of all those who have died, believer and unbeliever. He's going to reunite body with soul, those souls that have been in heaven or hell before the Lord's coming again. And he's going to gather up those of us who are still alive, take us up into the air to meet with the Lord and to stand before the judgment seat, the judgment throne of God. And it's a glorious, it's a powerful throne on which Jesus, the judge of all, will sit. But how does he judge? Not based on our actions. Not based on our works. He judges on whether we have faith that Jesus is our Savior. And then the separation takes place. Jesus, as judge, judges on faith, and those who do not have faith will be separated from Jesus for all eternity to suffer body and soul eternally separated from God in hell. But those who do, who did have faith in Jesus during their life, they will be gathered together to live eternally, body and soul, in the perfect joy and glorious presence of Jesus for all eternity. And he says that on that day, we will be given glorious, glorified, perfect bodies like his body. As Paul writes to the Philippians, God will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. What hope that gives us. What hope that gives us as we yearn and groan for the end. See, for the Christian, judgment day will not be a day of terror. It'll be a day of triumph, a day of victory. Because judgment day is the culmination of God's perfect plan to save a world and people broken by sin. On that day, we will get to see what our faith was put in. We will get to see all of the perfect fulfillment and complete realization of everything that Jesus has won for us. Yes, Jesus already came. He already won salvation and forgiveness and eternal life for all people. But on that day, we will get to possess it in its fullest and completest realization. And so we yearn, we groan for that end. And as we do so, the hope that that day gives to us, it sustains us and allows us to persevere through the struggles and the pain and the suffering of life and the in-between. That hope carries us through. It reminds me of an Aust- Austrian psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor named Viktor Frankl. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, he talked about hope. He talked about in his experience in two different concentration camps during the Holocaust, he saw time and time again that when people lost hope, they gave up. And they succumbed to the horror and the suffering that took place in those camps. But he saw it time and time again, and he saw it in his own life, that when people had hope, when they had something to cling to, then no matter how atrocious, no matter how terrible, no matter how painful the suffering of that camp might have been, they were able to persevere and be sustained through it. Hope is powerful. Likewise, when we have hope of what is to come when Jesus comes again, it allows us to persevere and to have our faith sustained even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances in this life in between. When your grief over a Christian loved one 
who has passed away feels absolutely overwhelming, have hope. Because the end is near. When Jesus will come again and raise their bodies back to life, making them perfect and glorious so we can share that eternal reunion with them in heaven. When you feel those aches and those pains, that weakness and that suffering and the deterioration of your body and mind taking place, have hope. Because the end is near when Jesus is going to give you a perfect and glorified body like his. When death rears its ugly head once again in your life, have hope. Because the end is near when death will finally and completely be swallowed up in victory. When you feel wearied and broken down by the the war and the violence and the bloodshed that takes place all around us, have hope. Because the end is near when there will truly and finally be peace for all. When you're feeling persecuted, rejected for your faith in Christ, have hope. Because the end is near when all those who mocked and persecuted God's followers will have to stand silently before the one that they mocked and persecuted. When you feel like you're treated unjustly, have hope. Because the end is near when the perfect, righteous, and just judge will ensure that justice will be carried out. When you feel the weight and the burden and the guilt of your sin weighing down so heavily on you, have hope. Because the end is near when Jesus will come and perfect us and make us holy for all eternity, judging us not based on the things that we have done or failed to do, but judging us based on what he, our Savior, has done in our place as our perfect substitute. Friends, that's what gives us eternal and lasting hope. That's what gives us hope for eternity. As Paul so simply confesses, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. That's our eternal hope, that our Savior Jesus lived for you and he died for you and he rose for you. That's what gives us the absolute certainty of eternal life and eternal hope because that Savior who lived and died and rose for you is coming back again And when he does, he will take you so that we will be with the Lord forever. With the Lord forever. What greater hope is there than that? And so as Paul encourages his brothers and sisters in Thessalonica, he encourages us the same today. Brothers and sisters, encourage one another with these words. No matter how much pain or suffering, no matter how terrible the circumstances of your life in this time in between might be, Encourage one another with these words. Because the end is near. So have hope. Amen.